Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out this morning. And um, we've got our panel. We're sorry we're late. Um, party went too late last night. Um, so why don't um, actually why don't you uh, all of you come out right now, and then uh, uh, Tia Lesson, our fellow board member of the film festival, is going to do this with me. We'll, we'll co-moderate this thing. So please welcome Tia Lesson. Yeah, everybody just come out of all interviews when you get up here, yeah. If we can read from the back. Oh, okay, yes, right. You can, this is even the back where you're sitting. Oh, it took us five years before we started writing the names on the back. We never knew where we went or going when we were up here. One year I played Vin Vendors, another year Malcolm McDowell. Thank you. Started talking out there in the lot in the hallway, and we are backstage. But we should take this out here and let you guys in on this. <clears throat> um, all right, let me. I'll go down in the order. Well, I can't read that far, but I can think I can see everybody. Um, what you have up here is a group of uh, exceptional um, documentary filmmakers, and they've each made one of my. Uh, favorite documentaries of this year. Um, and, you know, we watch a lot of documentaries <clears throat> for this festival. As you can imagine, I get a lot sent to me. And I'm on the, you know, the documentary uh, branch committee for the Oscars. And so <clears throat> we get a, sent about 160 documentaries. Sundance gets, I don't know, what, 4,000 documentaries a year. Is that right? Something, Tia, something like that? So <clears throat> a lot of documentaries get made. And... Uh, <coughs> Very few, in my uh, humble estimate, uh, attain uh, the level uh, that these documentaries are at uh, this year. So please, if you get a chance to see them this week, I encourage you to do that. Um, <clears throat> sitting next to me is uh, Joanna Hamilton. Uh, she uh, made a film called 1971, a story of a, of a group of kind of average everyday people, no offense to the two average everyday people sitting there. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's like some of you were like, one was a teacher, and one was, I mean, someone was a baker, I don't know. It was, there's, they just, they, had a, they were protesting against the Vietnam War, and they thought uh, 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 the FBI was maybe spying on them. And so, what better way to find out than to break into the FBI office uh, in suburban Philadelphia and, f and find out. And lo and behold, did they ever find out, they took the files with them, and they uh, gave them, um, and, and, and uh, John and Bonnie here, are two of the people, and they just came out last year. Uh, no, they were never caught, nobody knew who did this, until uh, last year when, this, when Joanna made this film and the film was gonna come out, they came out, and um, probably thinking, well, you know, it's, it's the Obama years and you were safe, the other panelists will disprove that theory to you, <laughs> and we hope we get to see you again. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, but uh, but uh, Joanna has made an excellent film, and we'll talk about uh, this uh, in a bit. Uh, next down there, oh, and, and, and Betty also uh, 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 wrote for the Washington Post and broke the story. They uh, did, did you guys know her? Did you when you sent this to the the files, you knew who she was? I knew who Betty was. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, and 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 and. I didn't know who they were. You didn't know who they were. I did not know who they were. So you were getting this stuff anonymously. Yeah. Wow. Huh? And he's written a book. And yes, and Betty's written a book about this too, but uh, uh, but uh, but she was the courageous Washington Post reporter. You can't say those words anymore, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> but back then the Washington Post was uh, kicking some good butt, and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 Betty, um, uh, we're really honored and proud uh, to have you here uh, uh, today. Um, and uh, next to her, kind of, uh, I'm just trying to figure out the order we've got things in. Um, 
we have a Brian uh, Neppenberger. Neppenberg? Neppenberg. Ne Neppenberger. Yeah. Uh, he made a film uh, called The Internet's Own Boy, the story of uh, Aaron Schwartz, uh, the, the young man who helped to invent Reddit and a whole bunch of other things that you're familiar with. Maybe you didn't know who was behind this, but he was just a genius from, a, from his teen years on and, um, and really felt that the Internet should be for the people. Um, and not controlled by the government or private corporations or whatever. And he believed information should be free. And, and he believed that uh, places like uh, MIT and Harvard and whatever, they've got stuff in their libraries that should be shared with the public. And, uh, and so he went into MIT one day to, I'll let you, we'll get into this a little later, but uh, 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 to make uh, their research papers available uh, to everyone. I mean, this is, this is a fairly new concept for professors and universities to hoard this stuff. Back when we were growing up, uh, somebody like Jonas Salk, he would discover the, the cure for uh, 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 polio. And not only would he make his papers free and available to everyone in the world, he'd make the actual vaccine free and, and didn't want a single dime of any profit uh, of the polio vaccine. That's the way people, in a lot of ways, used to be. It's very rare to see that these days. And this is how Aaron was. And then the Obama administration went after him. Uh, the, fe the federal prosecutor in Boston went after him uh, for uh, trying to make the, the stuff in the library free and open to anybody. And they hounded him and they harassed him. And is the saddest movie uh, to watch, a, a young person. You know, if you're not used to this, and I, I mean, I, can, I mean, I can't really relate to what he went through, but I mean, I've been, you know, I've been doing this since I was 18, so I know the early years of the of the kind of hassle, but by the time, you know, I made Fahrenheit and they caught the guy that tried to blow up our house, I was like, oh, well, okay, <laughs> just another, another day in my life. But this is a kid. This was a, how old was he when he, uh, 20? 26. 26. He couldn't handle it and he killed himself. And, um, and they, he's made a wonderful uh, film about this uh, and this man should be remembered. Um, okay, who do we got next uh, down here? I don't have my good glasses on. Oh, it's Todd. <laughs> uh, hi, Todd. Um, Hello, Michael. Uh, Todd Miller made Dinosaur 13. Has anybody seen this one yet? Uh, this is a, oh man, this is, I don't even want to tell you what this is about. I just, I just sat there. I didn't know the story. And I just, I, I couldn't, I, uh, I just, my jaw was open. I couldn't uh, believe it. I said, no, this isn't going this way. And it, 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 it was a, it's a story about a group of average Joes in the Dakotas out in the Plain States. They're amateur paleontologists. They like to go looking for dinosaur bones. And they're just, again, they're just average Joes. They're not, um, they don't have any degrees or anything. They just go out there with little toothbrushes and looking for dinosaurs, <laughs> except one day they discovered the largest dinosaur find ever of the most intact dinosaur ever. And, you know, you would think they would be hailed as geniuses or whatever, but, but there's a whole, just like there is for many uh, professions, an apparatus that says only certain people are allowed to do this, and you better have gone to one of those schools, and you better work for one of those companies or whatever, and then they, all the just came down on them. Um, and um, I don't want to give too much away, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just an amazing story. The end of the story, you've probably seen, I won't tell you what it is, but, it's, but um, then it'll, it'll kind of come together. But it, um, boy, I mean, watch this movie. It's just, it's just an amazing, um, uh, amazing film. James Spioni. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we were just kidding about his name backstage. Um, whether we pronounce the E or not. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's optional. optional. You don't care either way. All right. Um, James made um, a, a, a film called Silenced. And it's a film essentially about the Obama administration war on whistleblowers. Uh, the Obama, Obama has, has prosecuted uh, more whistleblowers than all the previous presidents combined. This is just a, a disgusting story, <laughs> and we're going to talk about it. And um, and uh, and then of course Tia <laughs> is going to take it away very shortly here. <laughs> but um, and Tia made Trouble the Water um, was nominated for the Oscars a couple of years ago, and now is on our board of directors here. Um, 
and uh, and I worked with Tia for a long time, and and before that, Tia was very active in a number of political things in the in the D.C. area, and um, and was only arrested. How many times have you been arrested, actually? Would you say what was your last count? You mean for political reasons or for otherwise? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 we're, we're past 10, I think. We're past 10, okay. All right. Um, so, there you go. She's got her cred there. Um, anyways, uh, why don't we give them all a nice uh, round of applause uh, for being here. So, we titled this panel, uh, Nixon Obama, um, and, uh, it was painful to write those two words, uh, next to each other. And, um, but as I watched a number of these films, well, the first one, 1971, takes place during the Nixon administration. Um, uh, Dinosaur 13 takes place during first Bush slash uh, Clinton? Yeah, 1990 to 2000. Okay, all right. Um, and then the rest of this uh, nonsense is with the Obama administration. And, um, and part of it is just after I watched all this, I just thought, um, since this time, in 1971, uh, I would have hoped by now a lot had changed. Um, but uh, we can see clearly that it has, only for the worse. And, um, and, 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 and you, you'll see the seeds of Edward Snowden you know, exist in these stories uh, up here and why they're so intent on, uh, on going uh, after him um, and Julian Assange and, and uh, WikiLeaks. So... Um, so I thought this was worthy of a discussion amongst uh, those of us who would get up this morning uh, to talk about it. And also talk about um, not just the issues, but also I don't pick movies uh, in the festival here. Deb, Deb neither. We don't uh, do it just because we agree with the politics of it. It's, uh, it has to be a really good movie. And, um, and um, I've often said, and I say this to documentary film students, that you have to put the art first and then the politics if you put the politics first ahead of the art in other words if you make a shitty movie your politics aren't going to go anywhere you have to honor the fact that this is cinema that you're not you know giving a sermon in a church you're not running for office you're not this isn't a political organization this is a work of art and the people up here are always struggling to find ways to to take a message or an issue a point of view but but express it in this artistic uh, way and um, and so you have and this is done in other art forms uh, you know these are all versions of Howell um, and and the, the best documentaries are and so um, so I think I, why don't I start with the the Nixon crowd uh, here my my first four uh, guests and um, I've never uh, been called that <laughs> The uh, um, so so when now now remind me again what the how many of there were you there were seven of you or eight, eight of us eight. eight of you okay and all these years nobody told anybody anything we didn't have to uh, we did what we did uh, and uh, that was the end of our of our action uh, Betty had to take uh, the ball and and run it uh, so we can get published, uh, and then finally uh, some people in Washington uh, got brave uh, and began to uh, have investigations of the FBI, uh, and that led to some uh, rather nice uh, restrictions that lasted only until 9-11. Now we're back to the game's wide open. Mm. Um, the, uh, uh, John, what, 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 was your, what did you do at the time? What was your profession? Uh, I was a, a professor of religion uh, at Temple University. Uh, Naturally, yes. <laughs> a professor of religion, and and uh, and who were some of the other people? What did they do for a living? Go ahead, Don. Uh, <clears throat> well, our our leader and and main strategist, Bill Davidon, who's not with us any longer, unfortunately, was a brilliant uh, physicist at Haverford College. Um, I was a childcare director and mother of three children. 
Uh, another of us was drop, had dropped out of college, Keith, to protest the war and was driving a cab in Philadelphia. And he was our key man. Yeah, he was our he was our break in, break in our literally the guy with the keys, right? <laughs> or who could pick the lock? Who yeah, could pick the lock, right? Um, one other person was a professor, and uh, who am I who am I leaving out? Now? Bob was a social worker. Bob was a social worker with the Department of Public Welfare in Pennsylvania. And the um, final, final two people were, were graduate students, I believe. It's very hard uh, to imagine these days uh, a religion professor, a physicist, a couple of moms, a cab driver, uh, uh, getting together to um, do something as, I mean, seriously, if you were caught today in post 9-11 Obama America, honestly, um, how long would you be put away for? I mean, it would just be. Well, I think we would have been put away for quite a while back then too. But <laughs> yeah, um, but the, but yeah, but but there was public opinion because once this came out, COINTELPRO, once this all, you know, once the public knew about this, there was enough outrage, and there was enough, and there were enough uh, senators uh, who you know, wanted to have an investigation. And, and good things did come out of this. I mean, uh, right, Betty? I mean, it's good things did come out of it, but uh, it, it wasn't easy. <laughs> uh, the, it's important to, to remember, especially when you're drawing the contrast with today, that prior to what they did in regard to all intelligence agencies, the atmosphere that existed was exactly what the government wanted and that was total silence. I mean, the culture was that you didn't pay attention to intelligence agencies. There was no official oversight, uh, and uh, there also was no journalistic coverage of intelligence agencies. And so pe people had no idea that the FBI was anything other than what J. Edgar Hoover's vast public relations system wanted them to think it was, which was the defender and protector of, of all Americans. So there was outrage. I mean, people were really upset when they learned this information from the media files. For instance, the idea that one of the files said that FBI agents were supposed to uh, create enhanced paranoia and make people think there was an FBI agent behind every mailbox. And then later files that came out described specific awful things, such as the killing of Black Panthers and um, trying to induce Martin Luther King to commit suicide. But the move to re revealing more and bringing things under control uh, took four years. Uh, and it was, it was stopped by some very progressive people in the Senate. You had people for the first time in Congress saying, we've got to look at the FBI, we've got to look at Hoover, but uh, there also were people who stopped that. And not until the end of 1974, after we learned about COINTELPRO, the really outrageous things that Hoover was doing, plus the fact that the CIA, in violation of its own code, uh, was also doing massive domestic surveillance. Did the Senate then create the Church Committee that mm -hmm. investigated all intelligence agencies? It really, I was going to say, it really does take a lot of time. I mean, it was from 71 till 75, so it was a four-year period before a true investigation took place. I mean, to reiterate, I think... That's they, fast for us. Where are you from? Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I mean, I think what they did back in the day was create a national discussion right. um, that had never happened before. And I think that's exactly what Edward Snowden has done again. And I get, but that, again, that's a discussion that we haven't had since, you know, since but the it was, it September was 11th at, era. I, I, at the time when they did this, uh, and, and others did uh, similar things, I mean, I don't think any of us really, the, 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 you know, making the comment about your, your FBI file, there was no such, you wouldn't say that. Uh, and then when this became apparent, it was, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure, I mean, a number of people I know, you know, that Michigan uh, had a state police had a, what was called a red squad, mm -hmm. and they kept files on protesters. And, but they did worse things. I mean, like you said, the FBI, yeah, yeah. they assassinated people. Yeah. They killed Fred Hampton yeah. uh, in yeah. his sleep in Chicago along with his roommate who, a guy from Flint, uh, a guy named Mark Clark. 
They were both just shot in their bed by the FBI busting through the door. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and other examples of this were just absolutely horrendous. Which then, I'll ask you this, and <clears throat> so now uh, we've learned through Snowden that uh, basically they have access to the people that we've called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and even more than that. Mm. Yeah, worse, same thing, not so bad. I got nothing to hide. <laughs> no, if I don't have, if I, if I haven't done anything wrong, then I don't, I, I don't have to hide. I don't, I don't have to have privacy. It's protecting me from terrorists. Yeah, yeah. That's bad thinking. Well, I know when, <laughs> when people say that to me, I, I say to them, do you, do you close your curtains at night in your bedroom? Uh, um, well, yeah, of, of course, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, I said, wow. You have a password on your email? Yeah, yeah well, you're not committing a crime in bed there. Uh, why, uh, why do you need your curtains closed? <laughs> You know, why, why don't we have a right to see what's going on there? Why doesn't the government have a right to see that? I mean, privacy, just in and of itself, it's not about whether you're doing something wrong. It's just about leave me alone. Uh, you know, basically. <laughs> it's I think it's called the ethics of privacy. The what is? The ethics of privacy. You know that? Thing? Yes, that's a better that way to put it. Ethics. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> I just flunked his religion class. <laughs> Um, but, uh, well, is there anything else you want to add to this, uh, Joanne, before we... Uh... Uh, no, I was just going to say that, um, to your point about them, the fact that they were never caught, I think if they had been caught back in the day, it would have been draconian. I think they would have been as infamous, as notorious, as um, mm. famous as Daniel Ellsberg. Mm. And in fact, Daniel Ellsberg, because I think he, because he had spoken about what he had done more, he was easier to find and easier to catch. I mean, before the trial collapsed, I think it was over a hundred years that he was facing. I think they would have faced similar circumstances. And, so and, and, yeah. and in today's environment, NSA environment, for sure. how quickly would it have you know, taken for these eight people, these whistleblowers, to be nabbed? Mm. Would it have been a day? Would well, you been guys a week? made Xerox copies and passed it I mean, with We didn't uh, even have cell phones in right? those days. So. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give them credit also for being extremely smart uh, in the way that they they did their casing, and in the way they conducted their lives afterwards. And here's like, and here's one of the incredibly smart things they did. This is just, it's part smart and it's part um, I, maybe their sense of humor. But um, they, they were trying to figure out which day should we break in, which night should we break in, and they and the the, the famous uh, Muhammad Ali uh, Joe Fra Joe Frazier, right? Yep. The right. famous yeah. uh, first. the first one, right? The, the comeback, <clears throat> and. Um, uh, so they said, let's do it on the night of that fight because uh, 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 everybody will be watching the fight, especially cops. And, and, uh, and, the, and the building they were in, uh, everybody would have the fight on and turned up. And sure enough, it was just the fight was on in the building and nobody was listening. The security guard couldn't hear anything. And they were able, because they're not really professional burglars, so they, they kind of bungled their way through getting in uh, to this office. But um, um, it, it, I just thought that was such a nice twist that you chose the night of this important uh, heavyweight fight. It's and, dramatic, and, if nothing else. Huh? <laughs> it's dramatic, if nothing else. Yes, yeah, right. It was like they're ready. <laughs> How you kept quiet about I would just want to tell that story over a few drinks. Well, we had uh, to do what we did because nobody in Washington would do what needed to be done. We have to remember that J. Edgar Hoover was the most powerful man in Washington for almost three decades. For five decades, he was head of the FBI. Presidents were terrified of him. Congressmen, senators, nobody would hold J. Edgar Hoover and his FBI accountable. So we had to do, the citizens, we had to do what Washington people would not do. That has not changed. That will never change. Because people who have power in Washington want to make the big decisions backstage, behind closed doors. They don't, want, they don't want democracy, they want a rule. So, in that sense, we're back to square one. Yeah, I think um, 
you know, any of the people in my film have said very similar things um, to what you just said. Um, they're, you know, Tom Drake often, <laughs> I mean, the, the whistleblowers in my film, I feel like are descendants of, of you guys. I mean, these are people of conscience who are seeing a wrong and seeing institutions and, and, and of power that are, are overlooking it or going along uh, and questioning that, and you have to step outside um, the power structure to do that um, at your peril. Um, incredibly courageous, what what you folks did, um, especially in that in that climate. And you know, um, but that idea of like wanting to work behind closed doors. I mean, and, and you mentioned 9/11. I mean, my my film kind of that starts with 9/11, and uh, you know, one one person in my film, uh, Tom Drake, was in the NSA. Uh, another one uh, was in uh, Justice Department, and uh, the third person, John Kiriakou, was in the CIA, but they all say the exact same thing. That day changed everything, and it's like everything got rolled back, the gloves came off, the rules went out the window, and it's a different world from now on. And it hasn't, it hasn't changed until, and they were speaking out and so forth, but Snowden really made the difference in that he had all this documentation, as you guys did. Uh, which made it irrefutable. But it's <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I guess I was just going to riff on that. The the um, it seems to me like you know my film's about the internet and this kind of new new world of information that we that we now live in. The um, it seems to me there's two things going on, kind of these two tectonic plates that are kind of moving at at one time. Um, one is 9/11, this kind of uh, overwhelming fear and anxiety that comes out of 9/11, and which is represents real opportunism on the part of people that are in power, um, a sort of power grab. At the same time, where our lives are changing, in that we at, at, during this decade, two decades, you know, decade and a half period, where we now live all these kind of massively networked lives, um, in which all of our lives have an online component to it. So, and the internet is essentially an insecure place, right? It's, uh, it's not built for security, it's built for a free flow of information. Uh, the invention itself is linking, that's, that's what the internet is. So, so you have these two things happening at the same time and there is a, a realization that, that all of our information can be, uh, you know, some, sometime around this total information awareness t period in the early days of, after 9-11 with Thomas Drake and everybody, there is this kind of awareness that, wow, we can't actually get everything and record everything. And um, the problem is that, that some of the things that came out of the church committee, which, which are these kind of adversarial courts, the FISA courts and all that, these things are wildly outdated in this world. So these two combinations of this massive fear and this net networked world that we live in have created this kind of witch's brew that is really, really dangerous right now. Add to that. The ref one of the big reforms was <coughs> establishing congressional oversight, yeah. and that was supposed to make it impossible or at least unlikely that we would have that kind of intelligence operation again, and instead it uh, died and was used to give intelligence agencies whatever they wanted right. after 9-11. Yeah, and it's just, it's just incapable of dealing with the digital age. And then there's this, this, um, this sort of, uh, it's it just a rubber stamp. Essentially, it's just a rubber stamp court. Anything that they've, they've bounced back has gone to this further secretive court, the FISA Court of Appeals, which has overturned everything that they've had a problem with. So, um, I mean, and that, and that is a truly secret court. So um, it's time to update this stuff, and, and you know, I'm super thankful that Edward Snowden brought us this kind of irrefutable proof that this is happening. Otherwise, it's we can just kind of ignore it. Well, I'll just I'll add a third factor, and th those two you mentioned. In addition, the rise of the corporate press, and the lack of funding for the investigative journalism that we need to expose these kinds of um, wrongdoing, both illegal and legal. I think yeah, I agree with that. It's it's back then you had uh, Hoover, um, um, you know, threatening Martin Luther King with you know tape recordings and things you know dirt that he uh, that he had on him. Um, but these days you have a lot of the media doing that work uh, for them. I mean, it's it's like Hoover Hoover's gone, but he's he's got a lot of people uh, that kind of like that idea of. Um, how do we take somebody down? If we 
can't arrest them. We can't kill them. Um, how can we discredit them? And so you float, you float stuff out there. Well, the yeah. internet's really, really a good tool for this. In the, right, it's evil it's a great sense. tool. Right. I mean, it's like you've got these things like um, uh, astroturfing, right? Uh, this sort of fake grassroots movements. You've got uh, a number of things that have come out of uh, sort of uh, other other dumps, other leaks that have happened in the hacker world that have looked at these kind of tools that people can use to manipulate. Um, well, you manipulate have FBI and CIA thing. people posing online to yeah, uh, disrupt conversations and change the, the an entire uh, world of informants discredit or, people and yeah. you know all, all that stuff's going on in the digital yeah world. yeah and, uh, and and just real tools that people have targeted for you know for the internet I mean you have Facebook doing psychological experiments on people Six, you know seven hundred thousand Facebook users were given happy or sad posts and they were then they were it was a test to determine whether that made them sad and reflected you know sadness or right. happiness in their posts right. so this is an actual uh, it was a massively embarrassing for Facebook right now but um, this is this is what's happening let's talk about fear a nation that lets itself be governed by fear will be a poorly governed nation because it will turn over the responsibilities the active responsibilities of informed citizens. They'll turn over that to those who say, I know and I can protect you. That's what J. Edgar Hoover did back in the 1950s and 1960s. The fear back then was the communist international conspiracy, the red tide, etc. Well, we're back in the game of fear again. Now it's the terrorists. And the folks in Washington are terrified of being labeled soft on terrorists. So they will take away from us the information we need to have in order to be active citizens, to do what we have you know, in a democracy. Sovereignty belongs to all of us, not the people we elect. We tell them what they should do and what they should not do. If we're going to do that actively and responsibly, we have to have the information. That's what Mr. Snowden gave us. That's what we gave you in 1971. Can we just elect you to something, or <laughs> can you promise us you'll live forever? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the uh, oh man, it's yeah. I I um, I uh, I did a, a Reddit uh, uh, last year and. Um, the, the hater groups came out in such full force, it forced Reddit actually to change their policy of, do you know how Reddit works? Do you guys know what this is? Um, do you wanna, why don't you explain that? Because I'll tell you, I'll. Yeah, Reddit is, uh, you, you probably did an AMA, ask me anything. Yeah, right, ask, right. So ask me anything. They verify that it's is actually you, and, yeah. and um, you, anybody can ask you whatever they want. So people can go and, and uh, they can ask, well, that's the thing. Whatever, whatever it is, from your favorite cereal in the morning yeah. to your pol to politics, <clears throat> and so um, it, it usually create usually creates a pretty interesting kind of debate about. Maybe you should explain who, what was behind Reddit, who's who who gets on Reddit, Brian. Who gets on Reddit? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, the, uh, here. you mean the. Yeah, the sort of who. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it's been everybody from from you know. Criminals to uh, you know Daniel Ellsberg has been on. Uh, Barack Obama has done an AMA. Uh, famous Michael Moore has done an AMA. <laughs> um, you know, lots of. Uh, it could be a, it could be anybody. It could be somebody in the news. It could be somebody that's just a, a kind of average person that's just done something recently. So it's it's really a forum where you get on and you just ask questions. But with it's with just mine, relatively figured... simple. It's not. It's actually not that. You know, it's it's right. just text based. It's not. Yeah, and I thought it was kind of cool. Ask ask me anything, and I'm you know I would I said I, I will answer any any question, um, and uh, uh, and I started answering them, but they had a number of plants and a number of the uh, that the way it works is is that um, the the people that uh, when you they log on with the most um, I'm not going to say this right. Uh, huh? Karma? Well, it's likes, likes and dis, basically up or down. Likes and so dislikes. Up, yeah. But they, they pound the, the likes on the haters so hard 
that my answer to this guy, you know, 20 questions ago is way down. I'm, been, I'm put way down at the bottom, and he, and he never gets to see his answer. They had to switch their policy after that because they thought, wow, this, whether it's the government, whether it's a hate group or whatever, they can really manipulate this thing. And, um, and it, but it was good for me because I was able to see, like, what kind of disinformation and how easy it was to put out about me. And, uh, and I used to kind of laugh about the, you know, watching the fictional version of me on Fox News or, you know, because I've always been kind of entertaining to this made-up character with my name. Um, but then it stopped, you know, sometimes it's not so funny uh, because you really realize, wow, they are really, they are really at it, you know. And I, and I, and I actually had this thought this week of just that something that was going through and I was thinking, God, if it came out, if it came, let's say we're all back to the time of Martin Luther King, your time, and um, uh, it came out in the media that Martin Luther King owns nine homes. What would, wouldn't we, even if we liked Martin Luther King, wouldn't we start to have a little tinge of, ooh, that doesn't feel good. And it would be such a genius thing, and it's so easy just to kind of plant. You don't have to have a sex tape. You could just, just plant lies out there enough. And because and, you, what you want to do is go after his base. You want to you want to soften his. You want to depress his support. That that's absolutely being done. I mean, what you know, we're been talking a lot about terrorism and the fear of terrorism. But what's astonishing about the Snowden documents is how many of them have absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. That, that's the cover story, uh, and you know, demonstrably, time after time, uh, the government has um, what's the word lied completely lied about what they're doing. And then the truth comes out later and, they, and then they change the story. And so, um, but they're absolutely, and uh, you were talking about corporate media, but corporations as well kind of use these, this came out in uh, Josh Fox's film about the gas industry. Uh, they literally use consultants who have military psyops backgrounds. How do we disrupt mm -hmm. Yeah. This community from from cohering together. How do we sow discontent? How do we make people question each other's motives? I mean, this this is the kind of things that are at, at work behind the scenes with all of this um, surveillance. Uh, you know, you know, what do I have to fear? Well, when someone has all the information about your life and all of your connections, that's a very very powerful tool. Um, it's not something to be dismissed, really. And, 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 and is someone making money off of all this? I mean, what is, tell us more about the national security apparatus and, and who's actually profiting, because it seems to me that yeah. there must be someone. Uh, yeah, w uh, it's a racket. War is a racket. The war on terror is a racket. Um, Tom Drake in my film talks a lot about this. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, there, there are huge amounts of money, not only huge amounts of money since 9-11, uh, um, huge amounts of, Unaccounted for money. I mean, black the black budget money. Um, there, there's there are um, actually the Washington Post did uh, do a great series about this called Top Secret America uh, that Dana Priest uh, uh, did, and um, uh, looking at thousands and thousands of these uh, contractors who, with these incredibly lucrative uh, contracts. So um, there's this tremendous uh, bureaucratic and structural incentive to keep the fear going. Um, and, uh, you know, um, so, uh, <laughs> there's a How lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. This is a pr that really particularly scary part of this story, too, is that because we can be, dis you know, concerned about NSA surveillance, but what about that next level of contractors in the same way that we, we hire Blackwater or something to fight for our wars for us? We, we contract these, we contract Booz Allen Hamilton, and there's a bunch of other, uh, there's a whole range of these. In fact, in two weeks, I'm going to, to, uh, DEF CON and one of the, is a hacker conference, and one of the, pre, the conference right before that is called Black Hat. It's, it's a conference of all of these um, sort of uh, intelligence contractors. This is a very, very murky world um, it, where that has even less oversight, of course, than, than the NSA does. Um, it's, uh, it's very scary. It needs to be, it's, it's, a, it's a, I think, an underreported part of this, uh, of this story. I saw it on The Good Wife. <laughs> oh, you did? Those no, guys are scary. A, there's been a number of... Yeah. That was a good storyline. I like that. <laughs> no, but I, I, and, uh, and, you know, in terms of corporate surveillance, you know, my brother works for a corporation. He's, he does uh, customer service. They know, because of his phone, where he is at any given 
part of the day. If he goes home to, his wife is, is in a wheelchair, if he goes home to help her into the bathroom, they know that. You know, they, he can get fired for that. Um, so it's not even just, he doesn't have any secrets. He's not a whistleblower. He's just an average Joe doing his work every day. Um, and if he takes, you know, more than 20 minutes to do any given call, you know, he's, he's brought to task for that. So it, so many applications for this kind of um, well, activity. It, it's also, it, it, it shows itself in, um, in, in kind of strange ways, too, sometimes in corporate ways. Like, for instance, um, Staples. We just learned this a couple weeks ago. Staples, basically, if you go online and buy from Staples, um, they geolocate you, right? They determine uh, if there are any competitive uh, stores, any, any like, you know, office depots or something ne near you within driving distance. And if there's not, they raise the price on your online purchase. Oh, this, is, this is a way that this information is being used. And of course, that, that, <laughs> that hurts people in r rural areas uh, and, and is kind of, I think everybody kind of has an instinct that there's something kind of wrong about that. So, um, but there's- That's uh, the thing that's bothered the audience the most so far. Did you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what? <laughs> more for that printer? <laughs> now it's personal. <laughs> but it has to be personal. No, it has to Absolutely get personal. Right. Yeah. You know, we did a film about the Cokes, um, and it was political and it was important, but when, when Coke money was used to stop our film and to take money away, it became personal. And, and I became angrier. And I think, I think it ha how, does, how do we make it personal for everybody in this room beyond the price they pay at the cash register? Well, yeah, and, and if, you, if they don't like your film, they could buy your name in Google. Ad words. Uh, they probably have the money to do this. So when somebody Googles you or your film, it comes up with a, a nice well, something about how great the Koch brothers are, and and, and uh, something nice and shiny and happy about the Koch brothers. They literally Towles. accompany you your name when somebody searches for you. So how do we make it personal for well, for everybody in this audience? Yeah, I mean that was in terms of my film. That was my. Um, my goal from day one was to take this sort of political issue of whistleblowers, and I, I started this well before Snowden, by the way, but I was just reading about people like Tom Drake and John Kiriakou, and, uh, but I wanted to make it uh, very much about them as people, that what it was like for them to go through these experiences of, of being uh, prosecuted uh, by, the, by the government for basically saying the wrong thing. Um, and uh, so it's very subjective in a way, and it really takes people into what their, their personal private experiences were going through this whole thing with their families. Um, so that for me was like an important uh, reason to make the movie was to, to get behind the headlines of it and to look at what it really means to take, to use the government apparatus to take someone's life apart. Um, and, and for what reason? You know, so that to me, personalizing it in that way um, was was kind of the whole goal of the whole movie. I was going to say, and James's film does that really effectively. Um, but I think you're exactly right, Tia. I think that's the the critical question: is how do you make it personal? I was very struck recently. Um, was it earlier this year, the CIA, um, when the CIA was caught spying on the Senate committee that's charged with oversight for the CIA, and Diane Feinstein has been really a big, um, you know, sort of apologist for the for the uh, all the you know the subsequent Snowden revelations. Um, but when it was discovered that actually the CIA was spying on her and her staffers, then all of a sudden she went on the Senate floor and that was not okay. She, she's been throwing so, this tiger meat for years and yeah. now she's like, well, why is it, why, exactly. why is it biting me? So, so precisely, so, so, so now it's at my doorstep, what can I do about it? I mean, so you're right, yeah, and I don't have the answer to it. And I think, but it's something that I've been struck by working on this film, you know, story that happened 40 years ago. It seemed like there was such a, I think the protest movement has changed. Um, there's, there is still a protest movement that exists, as you would see in, in Brian's film. But uh, it does seem as though it's easier today, perhaps, for everybody just to throw up their hands, because we live in this digital world and think, you know, there's absolutely nothing I can do. In which case, I would tell you to go see Brian's film, which is very effective at saying there are actually things that you can do. Um, but in the absence of, you know, wanting to be part of that community, what does everybody in this room do? You know, I'm not sure, aside from but I think know, get involved. I think it's good that you, you gave this funny, personal example of uh, Staples that yeah. people did relate to. Yeah. And, and um, I, 
I think that progressives, people on the left, liberals, whatever you want to call it, um, documentary filmmakers, uh, <laughs> that um, the more ways that actually we can do what you just did with Staples, I mean, we want to meet people where they're at. We're not sitting here expecting them to come to us. So the more Staples examples, the better mm -hmm. to get the average person to sit up mm -hmm. for a couple of minutes and go, whoa, what the... You know, I just, I think that's, I, I know, I remember and when, when I would watch Sicko with audiences, and when it got to the point where I was showing how in France, when you have a baby, the government sends somebody to your house twice a week to do your laundry for you. <laughs> People are like, what? <laughs> or, the, or if you're moving from your house to another house or whatever, that's a, that, by law, that's a paid day the day you take off to move, you're paid for that day. Just, but little things like that, people go, hey, how come we don't have that? Mm -hmm. Well, what's that all about? And then you can have the conversation, well, you know, we spend 50% of our tax dollars on the military and war and spying, and, and they spend 2%. <laughs> and that might have something to do with how they decide to divvy out the money. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Jim. Well, I just, t taking off from your, your point, I think it's really important with this national security state overreach stuff that we're all looking at uh, to get beyond the partisanship, and you're seeing that a little bit. I think there's a lot of common ground between the left and the right here. Uh, I know for me personally, the experience of making this film and looking very closely at how this kind of shadow state uh, operates, um, and, and the amount of money involved and the lack of transparency and all this stuff. Uh, I have to say I'm fairly, you know, lefty liberal person, but for the first time in my life, I totally, completely get the essential conservative critique of big government, of, of, a, of a huge bureaucracy, out of control, more and more money's pouring into it, less and less oversight. It becomes like this self-justifying machine you know, you add to that secrecy and lots of weaponry and other stuff, and, you know, there's a huge recipe for abuse there. But I think we need to, as filmmakers, think about not just, like, preaching to the choir, but, but how, how does this transcend our normal sort of categories, the partisanship and so forth that keeps us all divided? Because these are really issues that affect Well, I think everybody. Rand Paul agrees with you, and, uh, and Do I have that's, to embrace him? Huh? Do I have to embrace Rand Paul? No, no but, I, but I gotta tell you why he may be your next president, uh, because he is searching right now for that ground, that common ground between left and right, without calling it left and right, but just, uh, you know, let's stop invading countries, uh, let's stop spying on each other. Let's, this is going to sound very good to all kinds of people and, and maybe not pay so much attention to him believing that a fertilized egg can talk and drive a car and be a human being. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is this two-party system, though, because then it's all or nothing. And then it becomes, well, is he going to do that or, or my hot-button issues over here? You know, in other countries that have, like, parliamentary systems and multiple parties, you form coalitions, and it's a much more, I think, nuanced approach than bludgeoning the opponent and then doing what you want because you have all the power after that. So, um, I, you know, I just wish in this country we had a little bit more like, you know, Rand Paul makes sense on some things and no sense at all on other things, but if we can build a coalition around that issue over there. Yeah, but when they, when they, so, they the other side of my, wherever that fence is, uh, when they say big government, I understand, I can translate that, I know what they mean helping black people. Right. That's what they really mean. And taking away my corporate money for time. Yeah, yeah, and the rich, that's how the rich look at it, right. So, hey, I wanted to say something, John. That my dad was in World War II, um, and uh, after 9-11, uh, he was very upset. And I'm not going to put this, I'm, I'm going to try, I'm trying to make him sound more, more uh, eloquent uh, or elegant <laughs> than, than he, when he said it, but I just thought it really kind of uh, hit me. He said, "So, so we, let me. So we lost a quarter of a million Americans in World War II. One of them was his brother. To have these freedoms, including the freedom of privacy, um, and we lose three thousand people on 9/11, and we're just willing just to go. Okay, take it all." 
after they all fought and died for all this, lost so many lives for all this, you're saying, so we lose 3,000 lives on this one day, then we're going to just chuck our rights. It was so offensive to him on that level that it was like that his brother died, that he almost died, that so many did die. Uh, and it... Um, it was just it was just, it just didn't make any any sense and um um if if i can drop another d name uh, after my dad's uh <laughs> I, I don't i'm trying to figure out how to say this without sounding like i i don't really i i don't go to a lot of dinners or things with with people i'm i'm um kind of a social retard but um but i um uh uh before she died uh, susan sontag i was invited to a dinner and i just happened to be seated at her table and she said something at night because she got in a lot of stuff after 9-11 for what she wrote in the new yorker and um and she said you know we're really just one more 9-11 away from losing everything from this becoming a totalitarian a police state where and not the kind of police state where the government will enforce it or take it over the people will say here just take our rights we can't do this. We can't do this again. And then, and then she she proposed this scenario of, and I, I hope there's no terrorists in here listening to this because I don't do this. Um, but uh, um, but uh, she said, just imagine this: that if the next 9/11 incident is, it's a Sunday afternoon or evening, NBA basketball games are going on at different time zones around the country. And you have, you have um, a, a couple people with bombs on them walk into Madison Square Garden to a Knicks game. A couple go into the United Center to a Bulls game. And a couple go into uh, the Staples Center uh, to a Lakers game. And pretty much at the same time or within the hour or whatever, uh, they blow themselves up. They're not going to kill every, all 15,000 people in the arena. They'll only kill a few dozen, maybe 100 or two. But... Uh, thousands will die in the stampede out of Madison Square Garden. Um, imagine just that. How you just need six guys, six bombs, um, and uh, um, the games are televised, and uh, you will have the citizenry saying to the government, please take my rights, do whatever you need to do, stop this, I'm scared. And this whole thing of fear, John, that you mentioned, mm -hmm. it's just, I just think that's, but to get to fear, you have to have ignorance first. You have to have stupid, a stupid citizenry. Because, because if they're smart, they're, you're less afraid. I mean, we know this from the, if you've had kids, they're scared that the monster's in the closet. There's no monster in the closet. And what do we do? We turn on the light in the closet and leave the light on and leave the bedroom. And, and, and once they can see that there's no monster in the closet, then they're not afraid anymore and they fall asleep. We, we pretty much maintain that same scenario as adults. But I just think it's one of the most genius things the government has done. And I think before we throw it out to uh, some of the audience here, I just want to just touch on this thing because we, we haven't really said anything specifically about uh, this man that I voted for twice, um, that I, I cried the night the first time he was elected, that I would live long enough to see this. If you had told me 10 years before that this would happen in my lifetime, I'd be like, are you full of <laughs> That this actually, that he was elected, it, just, it was just so amazing. And then he did all these kind of, kind of cool, good things, and he gave that speech in Cairo. Um, you know, he just turned the temperature down. He got rid of that silly red alert, orange alert, yellow alert. All he, he took, you know, he, you know what I'm saying? And the, it just... And, and it felt like, and, and the things that, you know, we knew he was kind of a wimp on a lot of stuff, and, you know, we weren't going to get true universal health care, but, you know, he was, you know, at least doing something, right? And, um, and it's like, this is just so disheartening to watch your movies. Um, and, um, um, and, I, and I've been trying to figure out how to say to people this week here who are going to watch your movies, because I think the common thing that you're going to get during the Q&A is, well, what, what's our choice? You know, no matter how bad Obama is, I'm not voting for Rick Santorum, you know? <laughs> so, um, and I, I said this to you, actually, uh, James, backstage. Why don't you say what you said to me? Because I, well, I, I thought that was... <clears throat> um, <clears throat> is it still on? Yes. Oh, hello. Um, <clears throat> 
Well, I think one of the things we need to do is get beyond the idea that voting for someone is your full responsibility as a participant in a democracy. Uh, you don't just vote for someone and then walk away. Um, we tend to like put all our eggs in that basket. I mean, I, I, you know, I had a very similar thing. We're very excited about President Obama being elected. Uh, and then the slow re realization over the years, and then look, making this film, certainly, seeing what the realities were of, it's not just the person, it's the way power works and the way the state operates. And that takes you know people at the grassroots level standing up and, and making noise and, and saying something about it. I don't, I'm not sure we can vote our way out of these problems. I think looking at them and shedding the light on them is, is a key uh, a factor. Um, which is wh why the whistleblowers of my film are so important. And, and, you know, Tom Drake could have been, you know, friends with your dad. I mean, he, it was exactly that reaction. They all had this reaction inside the national security state of, wait a minute, there's a thing called the Constitution. Wait a minute, we have values. Wait a minute, you know, hold on. Why, why are we doing this? And, um, you know, so there are people of, of conscience and there are people who care about these things. Um, it's, you know, it's easily, easy to get kind of hopeless, but, you know, my film kind of like holds these people up as examples of, of heroes in a way, of, of patriots. Um, and, and I think, you know, so I, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I just think we need to get a little bit beyond the sort of thinking that there's going to be a savior. I think it's, you know, as you talked about, it was four years to, to get even to the church committee hearings. I mean, movements take decades. You know, the civil rights movement didn't happen, you know, in 1964 or 68. It was decades of grassroots work of, from, you know, lots of people. Who, right, but thanks you know, to the internet and the new age we live in, it doesn't take decades anymore. This state and the rest of America, 10 years ago this November, voted to outlaw, make illegal, make it a crime, gay marriage. It's in our constitution in the state of Michigan. Uh, and many, 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 many other states did this. And within, ten, where are we at now? 20 states? Yeah. It's, and it's just fallen like dominoes here. It's, I'm, aren't you surprised? At how yeah, but I, I do think behind that, though, was a movement for, for, that came out of the late 60s and 70s for, for gay rights. I mean, this, this went on for, for yeah, but, years, but, so there was the, a, another civil momentum. Civil rights movement, the women's movement, or whatever, never had a setback like that where they were made criminals in, a, in state constitutions halfway through the civil rights movement. There was, it was slow, but it was progress. And the, and the same, and we're still in it, we're still in it with the women's movement. But, it, but uh, the whole gay thing, I was just, I'm just like, you know, and, and now with you know, marijuana and not putting people in prison for 20 years for this, that's gonna fall everywhere. And, and the, the right is going crazy because they see now they've lost the cultural war. We've won. Majority of Americans look like us, think like us, are us. We are the mainstream, and and they, they the only way they can stay in power is through gerrymandering and tricking the system. That's the only way now they can maintain power. And I just uh, I don't, I mean, John. You were going to say something. I feel like John uh, would have there. a good answer. Um, well, uh, who who makes us safe? Who makes us safe? We do need NSA and CIA in some respects to help us feel and stay safe. But we give each other every day the gift of safety. Thank you for making me feel safe up here on this stage. When I get up in the morning and take the bus to go to school and teach at Temple University, I do not stop to think, is this bus driver a mass kidnapper in disguise? The whole of our public life depends upon a taken for granted gift, which we give each other routinely. Every day, we should say, thank you, thank you, thank you for making me feel safe. That's where safety is. I want to live in that world. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, it's, it's not am. something that a politician gives you. That's what the takeaway for me is right. there. It's not the, something that's legislated. It, it's something that's down here at where we all live. Well, this is my beef with the hacker security community, right? These are the people that create the so-called security 
online, try to protect our information and all this stuff, uh, of which there are some really great tools being created, really smart people doing it. It's one of the inspiring things that's happening right now, that there are smart people creating tools for us to kind of communicate online in encrypted ways. Um, but my, my, uh, my campaign with the the security community, the security online security community is the civil liberties, civil rights is a security issue, right? This is something that you need to protect, that we all need to protect, and that's a that's a very big deal. Um, but I, if I could just say something back to Obama, um, you know, I I teared up in two thousand nine too. Um, but I think liberals have just not been nearly critical enough of Obama. Um, he might be our guy, but. Um, but that doesn't mean we agree with him or can't hold him accountable or shouldn't be adversarial to him, especially journalists and, and documentary filmmakers. Um, he's been a ma major disappointment. Some of us were actually on and actually invited to the White House about three or four weeks ago to talk about, uh, maybe I should tell this story, to talk about, um, they invited some documentary filmmakers to talk about this new initiative that they have called My Brother's Keeper, uh, which is a mentorship program, essentially. It's a very it's sort of nice... Um, feel good kind of thing. I wasn't invited to this. <laughs> well, honestly, they shouldn't have invited us because um, it, did, it didn't go well. Uh, so the. What happened? Tell us. Well, what, <laughs> well, what happened was they, they, um, they, they told us about this initiative, My Brother's Keeper, which is about mentorship, which is about how young kids are not, are, don't have parents, need to have somebody in their lives uh, to, to sort of guide them. And of course, that's true. That's very true. Don't have any parents? You mean they're orphans? Well, it's the Big Brother Pro. They're, they're, this is the new Obama initiative. He says this is going to be a focus for the rest of. I mean, if they have a single, if they're a single mom or single dad, or that sort of thing too. Yeah. That is that what I mean? They're looking for a mentor. Yeah. So anyway, so they're they're telling us about this new initiative. They're now kind of rolling this out this in this week, and uh, essentially what I said is the reason why they don't have parents is because we put their parents in jail. Um, I mean. The two, it's a, it's a very big deal. 2.3 million people in jails and prisons in, in this country, another 5 million in the control of the criminal justice system, probation or parole. Um, we put more of our uh, own citizens in jail than any other country in the world, including China. China has four times our population. Um, uh, Percentage-wise, it's not even close. Um, you know, the, anybody even close to us in terms of mass incarceration is uh, people, countries in which we routinely criticize their human rights records. We really desperately need real reform in the criminal justice system, and that plays into all this fear and everything else too. So, um, so what was the response when you said this? <laughs> well, at, I mean, I'm pretty sure that at some point that the that the uh, White House uh, liaison said to me that um, you've deeply offended me. <laughs> It's, he said exactly yeah, he that. Did. I'm pretty sure that That's, those words came that. out. He did say that, yeah. It got and heated. I, but I think he was, uh, I don't know, it was an interesting moment because in the end... Were you guys all there? Mm -hmm. Where the fuck, where had, is my invite? It was... Uh, <laughs> it had to do with the... the it was because it was... The American the, Film Institute. It was during... Do, AFI docs. were there. It was during it AFI. It was during they, AFI. During they, the film festival in D.C. All people who were invited to the Traverse This City was not... <laughs> Please report to the Traverse City Film Festival. <laughs> we are sending you there undercover. Yeah. Well, and part of what they said, what they wanted us to do was to make nice stories. We're documentary filmmakers. They want us to make nice, feel-good stories about this mentorship program. And, and that part was also offensive. I mean, it is our job to be adversarial. It is our job to push back on these. On I, can, I, I just want to, oh, I'm just so, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm like... <laughs> Let me just say this, that all the new studies have shown that uh, kids raised by a single mom uh, don't do any worse or better in college or in income level when they get a job than those that have two parents. Because what they found is a lot of kids have miserable lives with two parents <laughs> fucking them up, fighting with each other, a miserable home life. And the kids with a single mom see a strong woman out there making things happen. It's all bullshit that the broken home or the single mom is, needs, that these kids need mentoring. Obama needs mentoring. That's what needs to happen. I'm really mad now. That's why you're not <laughs> I want my to vote invited back. to the Obama White House. Now we know why you weren't invited. <laughs>
Yeah, they, they should have thought it through, to be honest. It was not... I was going to say, just to go back to your initial point, Michael, about the, the, the fear, and I, I think that what, what happens, you know, after, you know, cataclysmic events like 9-11 or perceived cataclysmic events, you inevitably have the rollback. Um, you know, it happened after Pearl Harbor, right? And, you know, the mass internment of Japanese and various other peoples. You know, the, one of the things that was discovered after the break-in during the unraveling of COINTELPRO was the existence of the security index, which was, you know, which Betty can probably do an infinitely better job of explaining, but was essentially a list of people who, uh, you know, at times of uh, war or uh, otherwise should be should national be interned. Emergency. National emergency. Defined. Yeah. So those lists existed. I'm just, that we know now that those same lists exist <coughs> through uh, Snowden's revelations and through Laura uh, Portress and Glenn Greenwald's reporting. We know that those lists still exist. But I think the critical thing, and what I actually thought, John, you might say, um, uh, along with the feeling safe every day, was the you know that now you know several years on, we now have this opportunity. We ha we had that opportunity in the 70s, and we have that opportunity again now. Um, John's usual response is, you know, just simply you need to get mad, yeah. that there are things that you can do, and, well, and you why need to have courage too. And I think that's yeah. what, yeah. Yeah. I think we're blessed with people with that kind of courage. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's people like Snowden and Chelsea Manning and people that have come forward, um, Daniel Ellsberg and including, uh, luckily, we <laughs> have stars right here, um, th that, that are able to kind of push back that great personal risk to themselves to, to bring us information. Because okay. I do think with information, we're, we, we, we can make our own decisions. We can do what is really the point of this country and I mean, figure I, out how to govern ourselves. Yeah, there is a tradition of whistleblowing in our democracy, and it's a proud tradition, and uh, I think we need to expand it and empower it. <coughs> well, didn't the Founding Fathers, I mean, they, they, I their writings they were, they were very concerned that, that the, popu the populace did have a way or a mechanism without being punished to say, hey, this is, this, something's messed up here. I mean, I, I, can't, I just read something here a month ago about this, about they themselves were very concerned about um, not doing this to whistleblowers, that yeah. a democracy, a real fr a free society needed this. I, I just wanted to say, on a more, on a, t picking up where Brian was talking about, just on a more positive note, um, you know, the title of my film, Silenced, is, is a little bit ironic because, um, you know, the people in this film, despite what they've been through, are more vocal than ever, including John Kiriakou, who is in prison in Pennsylvania right now, still writing letters and getting them published uh, on, on Fire Dog Lake and, and uh, you know, telling people what prison experience is like and dedicating himself to speaking out about, about torture you know, when, he, when he gets out. And Tom Drake and, and Jesslyn Radak, the other two people in my film, travel around the world talking about this. Um, uh, Jesselyn is now representing Edward Snowden and is on the Sunday talk show, every single one of them, every time I turn on the TV. So, um, you know, th they, they are, um, there, there is a way in which this, the government overreach has sort of gotten this counter reaction where um, people aren't uh, kowtowing really, they're, they're speaking up and fighting back. And um, I think that's the spirit that we need. And Todd, did that happen with your characters? You haven't said. Oh, hi, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, let's hear from you. How's it going, guys? How about them dinosaurs? Yeah, so <laughs> dinosaurs. Uh, we all like to dig them. Uh, no, but it's interesting. A lot of the issues that have been discussed, um, you know, I guess the end result is it creates a society of have and have nots. And uh, I deal with uh, the scientific community in the films that I make. And. Uh, you know, in our film, Dinosaur 13, uh, that's what happened. You know, uh, an amateur paleontologist, uh, uh, you know, found this great T-Rex and uh, was, uh, was, you know, prosecuted for it uh, over the course of 10 years. And it's, it's really created this divide in the scientific community. Uh, you see federal funding has completely uh, just been um, obliterated uh, for not only uh, public institutions, but also private entities as well, uh, to the point where, you know, uh, we have archival footage in our film. In 1990, that's when the first Gulf War was going on. They had uh, Rush Limbaugh was playing over transistor radio in the background as they were digging. And uh, these guys were, you know, this was Western South Dakota, a rock rib Republican town. And if you talk to every single person in this community, 
uh, and this is where the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally is now. I don't know if anybody's ever been out there, but everybody is either libertarian or diehard liberal now. And a lot of it is due to the events that transpired in our film. And it just goes to show you how um, you know, government overreach can take a certain population and flip it. And, uh, and it's really interesting that even today, in 2009, Obama passed the Omnibus Land Bill, which makes it illegal for the average citizen to go on to a public park and take a fossil. Now, you might not think that's a big deal, but you will when you pick it up, and then a park ranger comes knocking on your door and throws you away for you know five to 10 years in a federal penitentiary. Um, and that's what's happening. I mean, we've screened our film, and I know a lot of the other filmmakers uh, internationally, um, and you know, we sit on panels, we go through Q and A's, and it's very interesting to see the response internationally with them looking at, really? What the fuck is going on over there? No, seriously. I mean, it's it's. I, I don't want to give away the ending. Is anybody gonna go see this film? Have you, are you got tickets? Yeah. I want to see it. Uh, um, well, he he sort of said, just imagine that they, 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 they should be getting given some kind of science medal for finding the largest T-Rex, but because they are of the wrong class. This is where I mean the, the issue of class comes in very strongly in your film. <clears throat> they were hounded and harassed and prosecuted. And, uh, mm, you know, I mean, it's just like, are you friggin' kidding me? Yeah, it's just, it's, even a couple pro other projects we're working on, you find that uh, these scientists, these brilliant minds where, you know, I mean, how much money are we spending on, uh, you know, military apparatus? I mean, trillions of dollars going overseas, and yet, um, you know, we got to shut down our national parks for two years because we can't get Congress to pass a, pass a budget. Now, when you start, you know, our film tries to, you know, attempts to show, you know, the beauty of science. You look through the lens of deep time and these big, heady issues um, and kind of step back and where we're going as a, as a, not only a society, but as a human species and how important these types of things are. And when you restrict, um, you know, uh, uh, science and whether it's, you know, uh, NASA, whether it's, you know, collecting fossils, whether it's art, whether it's, yeah, just academic research. Um, you are, you know, you're doing uh, humanity a disservice. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we live in a police state like everyone's been talking about. And I think it's, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to get any better. Um, and in fact, I think it's going to be, it's going to get a lot worse. And that's, uh, that's very unfortunate. I'd yeah. like to say. I want to turn over to the audience. But yeah, go ahead. I'd like to say something about um, a group of people that I think may be the most severely targeted group right now, and that's all federal workers. Um, I think most of us uh, don't know about a program called Insider Threat. Uh, it was established by Obama in a memorandum put out by the White House in December of 2012. So this is well before uh, Edward Snowden made his, first made his information public. And it is an amazing program um, that every federal agency is supposed to create a program where federal employees are responsible for watching each other to prevent leaks. So this is having a big impact on how journalists function, and it's having a big impact uh, suppressing whistleblowing. The most important thing, as we know, as to how we got the important information we, we have. Um, it, it they're supposed to instruct their employees. Each agency is supposed to come up with its own plan. And some of them have written these plans, and they are rather astonishing. For instance, uh, the Defense Department has instructed its employees that to leak information uh, is to be a traitor and to be eligible to be charged with espionage. And in the qualities that they advise the employees to view each other in light of, it is, uh, are they acting as though they're under stress? Um, are they having money problems? Are they, um, are they getting a divorce? Uh, I mean, is there anybody in the room uh, who would not qualify <laughs> under the, this kind of thing? Um, and so each part of the federal government has been instructed to set up 
these uh, what amount to snitching programs. And they really, uh, in some ways, they're, they're so well organized that they sound worse than, than what happened during the coldest days of, of the Cold War in, in the State Department. And people are also warned that um, if they don't report their fellow employees and it's later determined that they, they should have known that the person sitting beside them was a potential leaker, that they could be charged for, for not reporting that person. So it's, 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 it's severe and it, it points to the fact that whistleblowing, which is supposed to be protected, is really more endangered now probably than, than it ever has been and why people like Edward Snowden uh, and others on the inside just had to show extraordinary courage. And they're going after James Risen now, the New York Times, right? The, he lost his That's thing. Right. So he, if he doesn't say where he got that information, uh, uh, they're going to try to put a, a, a New York Times uh, in jail. A reporter in jail. And the, uh, the for reporting on a whistleblower. The director of, of national intelligence has uh, announced that anybody with a security clearance, and that is thousands of, of people, is under constant electronic monitoring of all electronic means of communication that they use. And of course, that means that communicating with a journalist uh, would be a very dangerous let's, uh, thing Let's to open do. it up, because uh, we only have a few minutes uh, to take some questions and comments. And actually, Mark, can we start with yours, uh, what you were saying backstage here about, I thought you were making a very good point. Uh, this is Mark Cousins. He on, he's on the board of directors of the film festival and um, was making a very interesting point uh, just before we walked out here. I guess I, would, I was just saying less elegantly what John said on stage, Michael, which is that governments governments are control freaks and always have been and so when any new technology comes along when publishing came along and people could make pamphlets and spread them around cafe societies in the 1700s there was a t the, the governments tried to control this and they were afraid of these new things called cafes where people could sit and preach and describe enlightenment ideas in France in the 1700s and in, in Scotland in the 1700s so anytime a new technology comes along uh, there, there, there will be New, new clampdowns. This isn't to say that we shouldn't act, it's just to say that the problem has a big context. And also it's worth mentioning that uh, whistleblowing is an international ph phenomenon and if we had someone from Iran on the stage now or Israel or China, we could learn from their inventiveness and their courage just like John and Bonnie were courage, courageous in the past. And when you, you know, we could learn from the people in the Soviet Union in the 30s and East Germany in the 60s and Egypt today, etc. That idea of how you undermine someone, you call them anti-American, but in Iran, what do you do? You, cha you challenge their sexual ethics. Uh, in China, what do you do? You challenge the dominant, uh, you challenge their sense of Confucianism, their, their loyalty to the previous generations, etc. So you work out what are the values of that country and that's how you undermine the person. So it's a very big problem. Mm. I can comment a little bit on the technology part. I think that any, you know, new technologies tend to be tool, tools of commu communications uh, and they become, they essentially become the tools of re revolutionaries. And as uh, powerful forces, governments, corporations and stuff begin to understand those and begin to be able to manipulate those, they be turn into sort of tools, technologies of control. And so I think the only way to keep that going is to keep the fires burning, keep the technological fires burning, keep, keep ahead on the technology, keep ahead of the game, and keep, you keep bringing something new. We're seeing that now with um, new ways of encrypting emails and, and, and uh, lots of smart people are doing really great things. One is called Secure Drop that was actually created by um, uh, Aaron Swartz, started by Aaron Swartz, uh, subject of my film, before he died. Uh, which is just a way of creating a kind of WikiLeaks type. The, the idea is a sort of WikiLeaks Dropbox, anonymizing Dropbox in every newsroom, right? Not one WikiLeaks that everybody goes to, but a secure Dropbox that can exist in everybody's newsroom that, that can be set up for a relatively cheap price. But how price. do you verify? What's that? How do you verify information? You know, well, they have a whole system. They have a whole system. It, it involves both encryption and also human human behavior because oftentimes an initial email can tip off a source, uh, government to, uh, you're communicating with the source um, 
the, uh, before you can do anything that's even slightly kind of vulnerable. I just um, worry that all this fear about surveillance is going to keep you know, the sources from speaking out. Well, this is essentially the technologies that, that are being created, this, this way of using the internet and the power of the internet, but also uh, ensuring our kind of technology. And, but I think that any technology has a good side and a bad side. Um, you know, we, we tend to be excited about the good things, right? With the, the shiny new things that we get. Technology extends our reach in these kind of magical ways, and we love it. Um, but there's always a dark side, there's always a downside, and we don't see that. Um, because it's not that fun. <laughs> it's kind of, it's sometimes it's so new we don't know what it is anyway. Uh, it's hard to see it. Cars is a perfect example of this. We love speed and freedom and and the mobility. But who knew when we started when we invented the car that we would also uh, change the climate of the planet? Uh, nobody could even tell that that was happening. So there's always this kind of dark side. So it feels to me like it's smart to look for the dark side. It's smart to look for how corporations, powerful entities can use technology and to keep those technological fires burning so that the revolution keeps going. Uh, who's next? Yes, right there. Yep. Thank you for the discussion. Are there any conspiracy theories that you believe have credence that we should be following more or that may be going from conspiracy to reality within the next few years? Yes, the White House is inviting documentary filmmakers <laughs> before they go to Traverse City. <laughs> Go, anybody have the answer to that? Well, I mean, look, before Snowden, uh, this all seemed like conspiracy <clears throat> theories. You know, I, I mean, I, I interviewed from my previous film, We Are Legion, the story of the activists, this guy, Barry Brown, who was looking into these intelligence contractors, and he seemed like a certifiable nutcase. Um, and yet, a year later, everything that he said seemed is true. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about, it's hard to tell, it's hard to discern what, you know, conspiracy... Whatever it is, <laughs> the key is evidence, or nobody will do anything. Um, with the media people, uh, this was essential. William Davidon, the leader of the group, was somebody who did not believe in conspiracy theories and did not believe in speculating. And he started hearing in 1970 from many people in the peace movement that he thought, that they thought, that there were spies in their, in their midst, that the FBI was spying on them, and first didn't believe it, and then came to believe it was true, and then tried to think about, okay, how do it, this doesn't go anywhere unless you can do something that brings the public along, that the public can believe. And so he tried to think, and he realized, well, Hoover's never explained himself, and the Nixon administration is never going to investigate the FBI, and Congress never has and probably won't, and that's what led them to their, to their act of, of resistance, great courage. And Snowden is the same way, that it, conspiracies are, are terrible. Get the evidence, and otherwise people are just cynical about the problem unless you get the evidence. Totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who's next? Yes, ma'am. First, a quick comment to Betty. As someone who worked for the Department of Defense for 36 years, you talk about a program in 2012, but that just formalized it. The yearly OPSEC briefings, what is the culture of the federal government? Um, being seven years out now, I don't real, didn't realize until years later how much federal employees we were brainwashed how much we were totally indoctrinated, and if somebody ever does a film on that, let me tell you, there's a lot there. Quick question for the Reigns, um, and your, you and your cohorts, is there a statute of limitations? Are you now safe from any prosecution, I hope? Uh, the statute of limitations was five years, um, but even after that point in time, we, we didn't feel it was necessary to talk about it. And uh, we depended on the wheels starting to turn to bring Hoover, Hoover's FBI under control. I don't think we have a very wonderful constitutional law attorney who helps us think through these kinds of questions. And he's quite sure that there wouldn't be anything that would happen now. So why now? Why'd you guys come a, forward? If it was a Nixon White House now with an attorney general like Mitchell 
perhaps. <laughs> so why now, though? Why did you come forward? It was an accident. Um, Betty was visiting our home, and uh, we had known her for years, and she, of course, received the documents at the Washington Post. Um, it's a silly story. We, we weren't planning to ever tell the story. Um, our youngest daughter walked into the dining room after dinner, and John said, oh, Mary, I'd like you to meet Betty Metzger. She's the one we sent the FBI files to. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. He really is eloquent. <laughs> and then, of course, Betty, being such a wonderful uh, journalist, uh, said, I would love to, to tell the story if you can help me try to find the others, and we can do it in a responsible way. What's so, the name of your book, Betty? Pardon? What's the name of your book? The Burglary, The Discovery of J. Edgar Hoover's Secret FBI. It's their story and it's the story of the enormous impact of what they did. And of course, in the process, they also learn what Hoover had been doing all those and years. And isn't it on sale around here? It's in the lobby. <laughs> it, Who's got the next uh, qu uh, question here? Where are we at? Yes. Uh, yep. I was recently in New York City and went to the 9-11 Museum. One of the displays there is a um, panel of uh, people talking about the issue of has America changed since 9-11? And I was struck by the fact that they had people like Colin Powell and the prosecutor for the uh, bombing of uh, the World Trade Center back in the previous... 93. Day, 93, and also um, all the way up to the, the recent the 9-11, and almost all of the panelists uh, spoke and said that America has not changed. It has become stronger. It has become better, and so on. And I sat there and said, you know, I hadn't been to New York City since, um, uh, since before 9-11, and almost everything was different. I mean, you know, every time you went into a building, you had to go through inspections. Obviously, you know, the airports are all different. Um, everything is different. And I couldn't believe that they would have this panel there that would said, we've become stronger, nothing has changed. And here we are sitting here talking about this. I mean, how can we have that kind of publicity and no one else seems to be saying it publicly? I would and I think you were hearing the official Reaction. Yeah, I, I think there, but there is, I, I think people, there's a gut sense out there in the world right now that things are not right. And this is a whole matrix of stuff. We were talking about this earlier. I mean, it's not just the national security state stuff, but there's a sense that the country is just off somehow. We're not taking care of, yeah, the really just important stuff that we're sort of ignoring, and we're being obsessively focused on this national security, national security, terrorism, 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 single-minded to the point where other stuff is suffering. And maybe we had to go through that decade or more of that, you know, I've, I've heard people say, you know, it's almost like the whole country has PTSD in a way. We, we, we're just not functioning normally. And we kind of need to come out of that and be a little more reflective and a little more aware. And I, 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 don't, I don't think we're the only ones talking about it. And I, and I do think there's, you know, there's a great turnout here. People want to start looking at this stuff now. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of how we've been going back and forth here, I feel like, this whole conversation. Like, is it dismal and hopeless or is there, are there seeds of change here? Uh, it's kind of, I feel like, that idea of the tipping point, you know, where you you can't really predict it, you know, you don't really know, it seems hopeless, it seems like nothing's ever gonna change, nothing's ever gonna change. And then it, the change when it happens, happens rather quickly. Um, so I'd like to think that that's sort of what we're working toward. Yes, next, yes, yes, ma'am. Um, we, ha we have a blatant example of this right here in Michigan. Uh, Governor Snyder, through the emergency manager law, has totally taken away democracy from several communities in the, uh, across the state in, and school districts. Most of these, most, all of them, I think, are uh, minority communities. And 
given unlimited power to an emergency manager and totally wiped out democracy in these communities. And as a state, we seem to be accepting this. And I, I just like to throw out, <laughs> throw that out for discussion. Why is this? Why have black we people? <laughs> it just wouldn't happen if they did. The, if if Snyder disbanded the mayor and the city commission in Traverse City, people would not. This would not yeah. sit well, and yeah. there would be or West Bloomfield or Birmingham. Well, that would yeah. Well, that's just they just got to write a check there. But here. <laughs> Here people would go crazy, but I, I um, no, I know this guy is really bad news. It's really uh, it's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. Hey, can I tell a story about him just quickly? Of the, that, if you promise not to say it outside of here, <laughs> right? No, because I'm doing my I'm doing my own investigation of it. But it's it. No, yeah, no, no. They're on the White House payroll. I'm not worried about them. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I just, I'm, I'm doing my own investigation on this, but it just, it's, I've just been rattled the last uh, couple of months. I was uh, flying out of here, or, or in Detroit actually, to, back to New York, and um, the guy sitting next to me is, you know, he's had a few drinks, and uh, he introduces himself, and the name sounded familiar, and he said, I, I was uh, Governor Snyder's first uh, state treasurer. He's the, the, we have an office called the Treasurer of Michigan, responsible for the Treasury Department. And he said, um, and I was, um, I was getting a lot of pressure. Um, he says, I'm not going to mention any names, but I was basically um, told uh, to get you in whatever way I could get you. And uh, income tax, property tax, is it a homestead? Do I really live there? He said they, I mean, I was given kind of a free reign to just, I was, you know, but, but, uh, he, and, and, and um, he said, I just, uh, I wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. He, he resigned. Um, I don't think over that, but, uh, but this was one of Snyder's things where he appointed a Democrat because he wanted to have the bipartisan uh, administration uh, as the state treasurer. But it really, the rest of the, I wanted, I, I wanted him to keep drinking because it was just, <laughs> I was trying to get as much information out of him, and I'm not going to say what else I know right now, but, but I just, it just was like those, one of those little examples that just come to my attention about, you know, wow. I mean, and he really had the power if he, I mean, he wouldn't have found anything, but, uh, but you know, they can, <laughs> they're just numbers. They can do they can do any of a number of things, and uh, it was really a frightening uh, airplane ride. Um, and I just wanted to share that story, but don't tell anybody about this because I'm doing something um, with it. But I just you just said Snyder, and I yeah you know, I just went you know you know <clears throat> when the government outrageous. decides to target you, they don't have to be right. <laughs> you don't even have to have done something wrong. And this is the great lesson of Tom Drake in my in my movie who was completely exonerated of 10 charges, including espionage, mm -hmm. but his life was ruined. He, he had you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars of legal bills. He could never work in government again. He could never for work for a government flee, contractor holes. again. Yeah. Uh, you know, just destroyed his family practically. I mean, and on and on. And he won. You, you know, so the point of all of this is not to, not to win against the particular person, it's to send the message to everyone else. You know, like the program that, that Betty was talking about. You know, yeah. this is what yeah. happens when you speak up. Yeah. I was gonna say, to your point about the statute of limitations, we, Betty and I were very, even though the statute had passed and you know, everybody had legal advice, it didn't mean, precisely as we've just been saying, it didn't mean that the Department of Justice couldn't bring, you know, all the legitimate claims had passed, but it didn't mean that some prosecutor couldn't yeah. decide to make this their case. That's, well, that's right. So we feared, asked the dinosaur people. Exactly. The federal prosecutor. Precisely. Decided to go after. They were going to put him in jail. 154 uh, felony charges. 353 years in prison. Wow. Largest criminal trial in South Dakota. Largest criminal trial in South Dakota for finding the largest dinosaur on the planet Earth. <laughs> Found guilty I own, of two I, I, of those. At the end of the I movie, won't. I just I, I really wanted to get, when they had that T Rex put together. I just wanted that, that motherfucker just to come alive. And just go after these, just like, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you, t 
<laughs> He's We're working on that. There might be a dinosaur 14, so we'll see. <laughs> Uh-oh. We're going we to have to talk to for Spielberg a, for that one. One more quick one here. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, we have a Petoskey stone in Michigan, on Lake Michigan. I'm wondering, that's 300 million years old or something like that fossil. Yeah, our state stone is 300, Are we not year, 300 to million years old. Petoskey stones either? Is that part of this? Well, the, the omnibus land bill that got passed, uh, which was, it was written into law in 2009, uh, there hasn't been any departmental regulations uh, in the various departments, uh, but there are going to be, uh, there are going to be uh, very strict penalties for collecting on public lands. So three-fifths of the U.S. land mass is public. Um, that's, you know, U.S. Forestry, National Park Service, uh, you name it. So, yes, if you sure, go and, like and pick up a fossil... And that is, you know, and now it, the, the plus side of it is for the first time in our history, we actually have a law that determines where the line is. The bad news is, is the way you find fossils is they weather out over time, rain, wind, freezing, thawing, uh, snowfall. That's how you find fossils. Uh, they weather out to the, you know, to the top of the, of the soil, the ground. So when that's why amateurs find all these things. But these amateurs now can't uh, collect them on public lands. And we're so underfunded, you know, and, and the parks or the U.S. forestry, you know, do you think that a, a ranger, and they do great work, but when you got two of them guarding, you know, 10,000 acres, there's all this antiquity that's sitting in there. It's our national resources, our, our you know, uh, uh, just these important scientific specimens are going to be lost. And when he says amateurs, he means working people with not a dime in the bank. And that was their real crime. Just make sure you got some money. If it's private, you're fine. If it's on private land, on private land. you own the land, you're fine. But if it's on public land... That's a great question, though, because all those Petoskey stones are on, on the shore, and no private person can own the shore of Lake Michigan. So, um, before, just before everybody heads out here, I just... Um, we're so lucky in Traverse City to have th this lineup uh, up here. This is, uh, this is, we would, um, we're, uh, this is a, it's a small town of 14,000 uh, year-round residents. Uh, we don't usually, I mean, this is really an amazing panel. And I want to not only thank all of you for making these films and encourage all of you to go see them, I, I personally want to thank uh, uh, the two of you and Betty, but especially the, the Mr. and Mrs. Rains here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for coming. Thank you very much.